So well, hello again. Um, so I'm going to continue with the next topic. Uh, basically, we have finished identical particles, and now we're only missing to cover two um, additional topics appearing in the course catalog, meaning the WKB method and scattering. Today, I'm going to cover scattering. Um, so let me start by sharing the screen, and I'll proceed. OK, so surely speaking, what is the WKB method is basically a semi-classical approximation for problems where you have bound states and where you also have so-called turning points that I'll explain in a second. So there's a little bit of a connection with classical mechanics to be explained shortly. And um, uh, well, in principle, um, the name of WK method is because of uh, some of the inventors, Benzel, uh, Kramer, and Brilun. Um, but uh, it has different names, and it's not the first time um, people have come up with a method like this. So in applied math, it's called also phase integral method or geometrical acoustics approximation or geometrical optics. We'll see actually why it's called phase integral method. And yeah, it's a good semi-classical approximation for problems with turning points with bound states. And uh, it's also useful not only for getting approximate wave function, but most importantly, to find a good approximation of the energies, particularly when you are in the semi-classical limit of high energies as the quantum number n goes to infinity. And actually, um, although the energies provided approximately by this method are most of the times not uh, exact or exactly equal to the true value. Actually, for the harmonic oscillator, they uh, coincide. They actually give the exact energies or the true energies. So I'll comment on that at the end. But um, let me start commenting some ideas, and then uh, I will um, simply follow. So. Basically, you have a particle with a given energy traveling um, through a region where there is a potential. That's the standard problem in WKB method. And well, there are two possibilities, right? I mean, basically, your particle might be in a region where the energy is uh, higher than the potential uh, in the neighborhood or not. Um, but um, to simplify ideas, uh, you might think of the simplest case where the potential is constant, so there is no force, essentially. And well, then the comparison is simpler, right? It's basically if the energy is greater than the constant potential or not. And you already know the behavior depending on the energy being greater than the potential or not, because well, if the energy is greater than the potential, you're basically moving like a free particle. And you have a movement uh, described by linear combinations of these types of functions. So basically, your energy is higher than the potential. You're allowed to move in a free particle oscillatory movement where uh, the wave vector or the wave number is given by this, by this comparison between the, kinet well, basically the total energy of the potential part and you can associate actually a wavelength related to this wave a number uh, to pi over k. So we're starting with the simplest cases, of course. Um, the second case in degree of complexity, assuming that the energy is greater than the potential in this region, is that, well, the potential is not constant, but perhaps it changes very slowly in the spatial scale, at least with respect to the wavelengths that you're considering. So for all practical purposes, at least in the motion for some wavelengths, the potential is behaving like a constant. And so it's not so crazy to basically approximate the wave function as in this form, but with time-dependent coefficients that reflect the slow changing nature of uh, basically the amplitude and the phase. So um, in principle, you can propose this. This is basically a phase amplitude um, 
representation of a complex number. So you don't even need the squiggle, but uh, the point is that you're assuming that these things are changing slowly, at least in the scale of wavelengths, and so you're fine. So implicitly what we're having is that uh, with WKD method, we have two scales. Have a small scale related to the fast oscillations for the free particle. And then you have a longer scale in which the coefficients of uh, amplitude and phase are gonna change and also the respective wavelength since you have this. And then, well, the other possibility of course is that actually uh, the energy is uh, lower than the potential. So again, in the simplest case, the potential can be constant. And if you have an energy less than the potential, a constant potential, uh, you're basically punching above, uh, above your weight. So that means that you don't have a free particle movement anymore, but you have some sort of tunneling exponential decay, right? And so the type of wave function that you would expect is basically something like this. Have exponential decay with k determined like this, and because the potential is greater than the energy, uh, this number is real. So you have actually exponential decay in the direction where you're moving. And again, in, under this assumption of uh, having energy lower than the potential, uh, what would happen if basically the potential is not constant, but it is um, changing slowly? Sorry for the distraction. Um, well, in that case, uh, you could also propose something like this. So, I mean, you have a certain exponential scale, which is defining a special scale with the decay. And you could think again, that in this case where you have tunneling or exponential decay, the amplitude and this constant of decay might also vary with respect to X. So perhaps for all purposes is constant, uh, at least in this approximated scale in a neighborhood, right? So yeah, that's part of the essence of WKB method. And uh, you probably notice that I'm studying each case depending on uh, the energy being lower or greater than the potential. So basically the situation is more complicated when you have energies actually closer uh, to the potential value. Um, and if you actually think classically, there is a name for the points where the energy of the particle intersect the potential. And that is basically turning points because if you think of a harmonic oscillator, uh, so you have this oscillation around the center and when the particle stops and turns back around the center of the oscillation is when all the energy is a potential energy, which would amount to this case. So basically, when the energy intersects the potential, you have the turning point which the particle cannot escape that region and you turn back to the region where the particle is allowed to move. That happens in a harmonic oscillator and qualitatively in some other basically um, potentials with a minimum around the minimum region, uh, provided that the potential curve is well behaved enough. <clears throat> but, well, um, so, Again, this case is more complicated to study. It's not as simple as the, um, particularly in the proposal of the wave function that you would have. And also because basically the differences um, between the energy and the potential will be noticeable. And that implicitly indicates that you cannot still think in terms of, well, for the sake of the spatial scale, the potential is constant because the potential might vary since you're basically comparing E minus V. So the variations of V are more noticeable. But in any case, um, you know, uh, in addition of having these issues that in the case when the energy is close to the potential, the wave number uh, is close to zero, meaning that you have a wavelength going to infinity and a similar situation for the decay where the spatial scale goes to zero. Um, that indicates why this uh, WK me method is more complicated to analyze in this region of the turning points. But okay, uh, basically, although proper handling of the turning points is the most difficult part of WKD, 
Um, I'm not going to comment too much on this complicated part. I think that would be more for a second study uh, or a graduate course, perhaps on quantum mechanics. But um, I'm simply going to focus on the comparisons with energy greater or less than the potential, the conclusions from so-called connection formulas for the case where the energy is close to the potential. I'm not going to present the derivation of these formulas, but actually simply some results pertaining to that that have some intuition, giving you the intuition, and then simply showing how the results from connection formulas can be used to calculate energies approximately by WKV method and that work uh, better as the quantum number goes to infinity, which is the so-called semi-classical approximation. But in any case, um, so, well, first we're gonna study the case where the energy is greater than the potential or in a region, and we're gonna call that a classical region. And there's a reason for that. So actually before I proceed, uh, let me share a picture with you. Um, one second. So, okay. Uh, why is this called classical region? Well, look, this would be the situation that I'm illustrating, right? I have a potential curve, there is a minimum, for example, and then the energy of the particle is greater than the potential in this region. This is called the classical region because in classical mechanics, this is precisely where a particle would be able to oscillate around the minimum. As think in the simplest case, a harmonic oscillator, right? You would have oscillation around this minimum. And this would be the case where all the energy is potential and the particle has no kinetic energy. It turns back and it oscillates around. So this is why this is called the classical region or the region where the energy is greater than the potential, except for the turning points. And um, well, the region outside the classical region in this case, where actually the energy is going to be uh, less than the potential, is going to be called the tunneling region for clear reasons in quantum mechanics, right? I mean, you already know from quantum mechanics one that basically when you're in a region where the energy is um, less than the potential, Classically, the particle would not exit, but in quantum mechanics, there's a probability to exit, which is given by an exponential decay. And that reflects the so-called tunneling, where it can basically exit via a tunnel. Um, so having set up the ideas, uh, let's uh, proceed mathematically, right? So we will write the Schrodinger equation, where you have basically the energy and uh, this sort of, uh, well, I can value problem, um, but we're gonna reformulate it in a simpler way uh, by defining a variable P. So P is gonna be basically the magnitude of the classical uh, momentum. And by simply passing coefficients and uh, defining P as this uh, square root, you can formulate Schrodinger equation in this way. So second derivative equal to minus P squared divided by H bar squared times uh, psi. So the thing is that P depends on X and it's a complicated function because it depends on the potential. So anyways, uh, at least by definition, you have that this P satisfies that uh, basically the classical uh, kinetic potential energy relation, right? Uh, just by definition, it's nothing else. So again, we're gonna distinguish between two regions and we're gonna talk about the classical region where the energy is greater than the potential. Um, as I showed in the figure. And again, in classical mechanics, that's the only region allowed for the particle to move around uh, together with the turning points where it uh, basically E is equal to V and, and it stops, but the turning points are measure zero. So in any case, because E is greater than V in this region, uh, if you look at the definition of P is given by square root, P is real. And so a real value. Um, so, Again, the same justifications uh, give us reason to think that the wave function is gonna be a little bit like a free particle. This is not too much of a big assumption because actually, I mean, what I'm simply doing is representing a complex number in terms of amplitude and phase. That's in general, 
the only claim is that uh, this phase uh, would be real because the momentum is real. So that's where the energy greater than the potential comes into terms. But other than that, this is basically a general formulation. And uh, the phase uh, phi being real is where I'm using this assumption. However, I mean, except for this assumption, everything else is general up to this point. And I'm simply gonna make this change of variables to formulate Schrodinger equation in this form for these two variables, the amplitude and the phase that define any complex number or any complex value function as I have it here. Um, so I do that. I plug in the things that I have. So psi is a times exponential, complex exponential, then second derivative, and then I have minus p squared divided by h squared times of psi, where psi is a times exponential. And I simply proceed to differentiate in order to get the equivalent equations to Schrodinger for the amplitude and the phase. So a first derivative, of course, is gonna have derivative with a times exponential, plus uh, basically you have i phi prime and then uh, exponential factor a. So here there is no change, things are simple. I just have to compute the second derivative again. And well, this term is simple. Um, this is basically very similar to what I get, but now with a prime. So this first term is concerning to this derivative of uh, this term where I have uh, a double prime and a prime, so very similar. But this other part, I have to be careful about it. So I have the i, then I have basically a derivative of uh, product of three terms. So I can use the calculus formulas that I know. Basically here, I would have the first factor is related to a prime. The second factor is related to uh, a phi double prime. And the second is gonna bring up basically um, a factor of phi and phi prime. But you had phi prime here, so that's why you have i and then phi prime squared. Um, but so far, so good. And if you regroup the terms, basically in terms of um, real and imaginary parts, this is the only imaginary part because this is uh, related to i times i, so that's why you have a minus and then uh, psi prime squared. And so this term and this other term are real. So, so far, so good. Surely the form can be simplified because in this amplitude phase of composition, you have a common uh, exponential factor, complex exponential in all of them. So if you do that, uh, this is the equation that you get. So you eliminate it, you get this again, two real terms, this imaginary term, and you have this. So uh, this is a complex equation. At this point, it's completely equivalent to Schrodinger equation up to the assumption that the energy is greater than the potential. And if you decompose this into real and imaginary parts, what you have is that, um, well, these two terms compose a real part, as I mentioned, on the right-hand side, well, this is the amplitude that is real because that's the whole point of the composing, right? This is gonna be a real part and this is gonna be an, uh, basically the complex part by a polar decomposition. Um, so, uh, well, the real part of the equation has this term, the imaginary part is equal to zero. And uh, so what we're gonna do is to study the imaginary equation because that one is simpler. And in fact, in applied mathematics, because I must mention that WKB does not appear only in quantum mechanics, it's a well-known method for PDEs. So um, basically the imaginary equation has a name there and it's called transport equation. And if you look at it, actually you can basically multiply by an integrating factor to make it simpler. So if you look at this equation and then you see, oh, then you have phi double prime and then you have two a prime and then have a, well, what happens if you actually multiply by a? So things get a uh, very recognizable form because here you would have uh, two a a prime, phi prime, and then plus a squared uh, phi double prime. So actually this looks very integrable. So this a is serving as an integrating factor. And if you compare, this can actually be expressed as a squared uh, phi prime and all that prime. Yeah, so just compare. Here you would have the derivative of a squared and here you'd have uh, the derivative of phi prime. So you're good. And this is nice. So um, again, I stress that except for the knowledge or the assumption that the energy is greater than the potential, everything else is basically exact. So um, we just proposed a 
form of the Schrodinger wave function under the knowledge that the energy is greater than the potential, but everything else is general because any complex number has an amplitude and phase. So, well, um, these uh, functions are giving us the solution of Schrodinger in a classical region. And um, you can actually solve this because look, well, you know that because of the relative of this is zero, uh, then this is a constant. Now, most importantly, we have already justified why the uh, phase is real and therefore it's a relative with respect to X is real and A squared is real too. So you have uh, this real coefficient C. And most importantly, if you pass uh, phi prime to the other side, uh, what you'll have is basically um, um, a squared, which is greater or equal to zero. So that means that this number uh, C over phi prime is not negative and you can take square root. So most importantly, because this number is uh, greater or equal to zero and uh, this is real, well, A, it can be either positive or negative, but A is real. And that simply confirms the assumptions because that's how we define the polar decomposition. So um, except for that, well, again, at this point, everything is exact. And so that was for the imaginary part, the transport equation. But the real equation is the one that is going to need the approximation because it's not so simple to perform or solve in general. So the approximation is that basically um, because A changes slowly with respect to X, actually the second derivative changes or this rate of change is very small with respect to A. So think about it, right? A is basically thought of as a constant in a very small scale. So that means that the derivative is small and therefore its second derivative is even smaller. So normalizing with respect to A, that will be the assumption. So first, let me write the exact form of the um, real equation. So we had this, which is gonna be equal to this. So at this point, things are exact. And simply if I have this equation and I divide by A, uh, basically I have this. And again, by assumption, because I think A changes very slowly, the second rate of change versus A is gonna be negligible. And I'm gonna make this approximation, which is needed in the WKB method, um, assuming that this is zero. So uh, under that approximation, we have the so-called Econal equation. And that's the equation for the phase. Um, and I simply solve, right? Because of course that simplifies things a lot. If I pass to the other side, I have this squared and I can simply take square root of things. And I have that approximately under the approximation, of course, uh, the derivative of phi prime of the phase is plus minus P over H bar, where P depends on X. And if I integrate, I have that uh, the phase depending on X is approximately plus minus one over h bar, the integral of p. And I needed the phi prime uh, because that appears in the formula for a that though exact needs the info of phi. So if I plug that in back, um, well, I have basically plus minus the square root of plus minus ch bar and then divided by p. And I simply plug in the results. So this accounts for the phase, sorry, the amplitude that I got depending on the phase. This accounts for the exponential that I solved. And I mean, of course, this is the integral, so it will depend on x. This is just a dummy variable. And I have the plus minus, right? So now think about it. I mean, I'm giving the possibility of plus minus here, and then you have c h bar. So it's simply easier if basically I define a constant which might be allowed to be complex, accounting for uh, plus minus h bar, and then with a plus minus. Uh, where you have k divided by the square root of p of x and then the exponential of plus minus this. So now the constant is complex, can be complex. And this is basically the result of the approximation of the WK method for the wave function, which is that you have two solutions, one with the plus, the other with the minus, where you have approximated basically um, the amplitude and the phase. Uh, and the reason sometimes WKV is called phase integral method is precisely because of this result, right? I mean, you have basically that the phase is behaving like the integral of the momentum over here. Um, most importantly, uh, there is also a very nice interpretation of this method, which is that let's say that I care about the density in terms of X. 
So I have norm squared of the wave function, and this would be the only involved term because this is basically of uh, uh, purely, you know, um, uh, imaginary in an object of complex object of norm one because P is real. So what I have is that the density norm of uh, psi squared is equal to norm of K squared divided by P. And so this is telling you a relation between the density and the momentum, which is very, very physical actually. So you can interpret it like this. The faster a particle goes, so it means that it has greater momentum, it will be harder to accept it because it goes faster. So it's like you have a car, right? And it goes very fast. And so you, you have a harder time to see it the faster it goes in a way. So it's harder to reserve it. So the probability of finding it is smaller the faster it goes. So this is a nice interpretation. It's actually called uh, semi-classical observation. And most importantly, actually, if, if you were to start from this assumption, you could rederive what we obtained uh, or what we stated at the beginning from WKB method. So basically, the implication goes in the two ways. And this is a very nice semi-classical observation with a lot of physics in its interpretation, which is completely equivalent to the WKB method, which justifies why you have this, um, uh, well, so-called uh, semi-classical approximation as an alternate name for WKD. But uh, again, uh, we have used in the assumptions that A changes very uh, slowly. And also we have assumed that the energy is greater than the potential and that the potential uh, changes very slowly in the spatial scale. So, and again, the general solution would be given by the linear combinations of the two functions, the psi plus and the psi minus. So, um, okay, so far so good. We got a very nice result. We got an approximate wave function and then approximation that disregarding a double prime with respect to a, which gave us a conal equation. And we're good, right? So that's nice. Um, so what happens outside the classical region, right? Outside the classical region, we have the so-called uh, tunneling region. So the energy is less than the potential in that case. And okay, we can also call it non-classical region because classically the particle wouldn't even be able to exist there. And, but we know from quantum mechanics that there's gonna be some tunneling. So we already propose a function of the type of exponential decay based on our knowledge and physics. But at this point, I mean, this is also exact, just knowing the decay. So this will take care of the decay. And I'm not gonna do the proof as I did for the classical. I'm just gonna state the result that uh, basically for WKB in the tunneling, you can prove that the wave function approximately would be something like what we got, but with differences, right? So, okay, this is similar in terms of the amplitude, but you have actually uh, the square root of the norm of the momentum, because now the momentum, remember it depended on the square root of phi minus V, so it can be more complicated. And then you have the exponential plus minus one over H bar and then the integral of the norm of the momentum so that you have a real number representing the exponential decay that you have here. So again, the momentum is now imaginary because E minus B is less than zero since you're in the tunneling region. So that's why you have to take norms um, and those are the results. But never mind. I mean, that's basically the result. I guess we can do the rederive it as we did for the classical, but I want to fix ideas by thinking basically of a problem uh, of the sorts of a particle impacting like a potential region where you have a potential barrier. So let me show a figure to set ideas. Okay, so I already presented a classical region. Um, one second, it's taking a while. Okay, so this is what I want. So basically, I'm gonna think about tunneling in the following way. You have a particle directed towards a potential barrier. So this is gonna be basically the direction of incidence of the particle. If you notice the potential is very particular because basically the potential is zero for X negative and for X greater than A. Uh, the energy is non-negative. So in those regions, the energy is greater than the potential. However, in the interval from zero to A, the energy is assumed to be less than the potential. So, actually the tunneling is gonna happen in the region of the potential barrier. So outside the potential is 
zero and you have basically free particle behavior. But here you have tunneling up. What is gonna happen quantum mechanically, because classically you wouldn't even be able to enter this region. But quantum mechanically, you have an incident particle. Part of it is gonna reflect. So that's gonna have a basically negative direction of propagation. Quantum mechanically, you're also gonna have some tunneling. So you'll have exponential decay in this region. And then you have transmission uh, for the part of the wave that survived uh, through tunneling. And you have uh, basically uh, the wave resulting on the traveling in this direction, uh, but of course with less amplitude. So, okay, I already said ideas with, um, uh, well, illustrating with a figure what happens. Um, so, okay, I think I have mentioned all the information that I have. Well, the only thing is that I'm going to call uh, the amplitude of the incident wave A, the amplitude of the reflected wave B, and the amplitude of the transmitted wave F. That's uh, basically the difference. Uh, but okay, in terms of what uh, it leaves as a wave function in for x less than zero, I have the incident wave and the reflected wave, right? So that's why I have ikx here and then minus ikx because this has an opposite direction of uh, movement. So this is a reflected one. And yeah, I mean, uh, most importantly, the potential is zero in that region, right? So the wave uh, number is given by this because B is zero. So uh, all the energy is kinetic uh, for the free particle case. And in the transmitted region, things are also simple. You have basically um, the wave function proportional to a free particle with the uh, transmitted amplitude for X uh, greater than A, as I showed. and of course, we're going to define the transmission probability as we would do for waves in electromagnetism, etc., as the ratio between the norm squared of f divided by norm squared of a. So basically, the ratio of the amplitude squares of the transmitted wave versus the incident one. And that's a very intuitive definition. Um, so those regions are easy, but of course, the region where you have the potential barrier are more complicated. Uh, particularly because we're not assuming any flat thing, right? So, I mean, we just know that it's going to be hard. But, um, well, perhaps some of the assumptions in terms of, you know, slow change of the potential in the scale will still be made. And, well, uh, the momentum looks like this, of course. Again, uh, you have imaginary uh, momentum. But um, with WKB, of course, under the assumption of a slow change in potential, we can have a hand wavy way of thinking what's gonna happen. So we're gonna use the tunneling formulas for um, what we prepared to do. So you have these two and you have, you're gonna have linear combinations of this as the solution. So now I'm being more careful how I'm writing this. So this is a dummy index if you want. I mean, maybe I'll write this if it helps to distinguish, um, but usually it's understood. Um, but okay, you have basically these two linear combinations of exponentials, one decaying, the other whirling. But I mean, you can also think that for the case where the potential is too high with respect to the energy, or it is too long, such that actually you have lots of decay, well, this term is not feasible, right? So you would actually expect that this term would be zero because it wouldn't make sense to have exponential growth at this from conditions to decay from the physics in the sense of you're expecting something like this, you're expecting decay of the wave function as it travels to the potential barrier via tunneling. So this coefficient is gonna be assumed very small. This is gonna be even the highest contribution of exponential decay. And uh, well, um, that's actually quite intuitive for uh, the assumption, not only of the changing scales, which uh, defines WKB, but mostly for a barrier high enough. So lots of difference between the potential and the energy or long enough such that the, uh, basically the potential barrier effect and uh, uh, the chance to survive through learning is very low. So, well, the last thing to compare is basically from the expected behavior, what would be the transition probability? So this is a situation that I was posing, and in particular, 
basically, let's assume that the potential battery is very long, right? I assume here. So what you would have in this region is basically free particle movement with a given amplitude A for the case of the incident wave. And then you have a very small energy compared to the potential. So you're gonna have only exponential decay, uh, the tunneling. And then what was able to travel through the barrier through tunneling is gonna give uh, the transmitted wave. But the amplitude of the transmitted wave is very small besides the, because the potential barrier was either very high or particularly very long. So actually the exponential decay is gonna act as the ratio between the coefficients of amplitude and the transmission. So if you look at this, basically this is what you expect qualitatively, the ratio between the transmitted uh, uh, amplitude and the incident amplitude is gonna be proportional to this exponential decay that you have over here. And of course, from zero to A, because you have the potential barrier of length A uh, by assumption. And also I indicated before. And if you care about the transition, oh, sorry, the transmission probability, this is known squared of this. So you would have uh, basically twice this factor. And if you define a gamma as this form, uh, you would have the result. So, but yeah, this is kind of like illustrating the results um, that we are getting here. So um, again, as I mentioned, I'm not gonna talk about the connection formulas. That's actually even by Griffith, it's indicated that that might be better just for a second read of the topic and Perhaps in another course on quantum mechanics that you'll have in grad school or in some other context, you will be able to check it. But I'm going to do, um, well, the connection formulas are basically what happens at the turning points, because so far we studied the case E greater than B or E less than B. So I'm just going to try to illustrate heuristically the results that we would get by studying the case where E is very close to B, which are regions close to the turning points. and. Uh, that's basically uh, related to connection formulas. But never mind. What, I'm, what I want to show is the power of WKB method to calculate approximate energies. So I'm just going to present the results, give you some physical intuition, and see why it's useful for approximate calculations of energy eigenbounds. So we're going to assume bound states. And so by assumption, there's basically okay, a potential. And there's going to be a stationary wave between the turning points of the potential as you would have in this figure. So what you have is that the system or the particle or the wave function is basically mostly trapped in a potential where I, uh, well, except for the tunneling at outside. And uh, basically this would be the situation. This is my energy E as I show in this figure. I have a potential of this form. So this would be actually the turning points uh, for the sake of the figure minus one one. And I would have tunneling outside. So, uh, well, here, if you were actually with energy higher than two, you would have escape energy, but that's not the case. So actually you're trapped in the potential well with energy lower than the escape energy defined by the potential. And well, again, in addition to the turning points, uh, well, the potential has uh, some finite holes, meaning that you don't have like infinite square well. So that's uh, actually gonna be useful um, in, is stopped. So the result uh, from connection formulas that I'm not going to present, I'm just gonna give some intuition, is uh, the following claim. I claim that there will be an integer number of half wavelengths in our stationary function between the turning points. Qualitatively, you would expect that. And uh, basically, additionally, one eighth of a wavelength for each finite wall of the potential barrier, because what would happen is, okay, think of the simplest case, right? I will have uh, some sort of a ground state, for example, and I will have one half wavelength, so center around the minimum, and then I would have tunneling. So that tunneling accounts for one eighth of the wavelength. Again, I'm not proving the result, I'm just presenting you with the information obtained from connection formulas. So that happens for each finite wall of the potential barrier. Uh, because when the walls are finite, as in this case, you can have tunneling. But when the walls are infinite, as say in an infinite square well, the wave function is zero at the turning points or the boundaries. So you could not have one eighth of a wavelength in an infinite uh, wall. Uh, but in any case, um, what I would have, and this is the mathematical representation of the result that I'm saying, is that the integral from x1 to x2 of the x is basically 
an integer number minus one half times lambda over two. Why this formula? Well, this accounts for the integer number of half wavelengths. That's why I have lambda over two. And then basically, when I have two finite walls, I would have in total one fourth of a wavelength. So that is one half of half wavelength. So that makes sense. And I can simply reformulate this equality by passing the lambda over two normalizing the other part of the spatial thing. And I have that this integral. So this is an integral over the uh, position domain uh, over the turning points. Uh, and then comparing with respect to the half wavelength is equal to m, an integer number, minus one half, which accounts for the uh, one eight plus one eight for the finite walls. Now, why is this useful? At this point, I'm just comparing basically the length of the um, interval defined by the turning points with the half wavelength, which is intuitive, but I'm not proving the result. But the usefulness is the following. Um, there's a relation between the wavelength and the momentum that you know from the Broglie, et cetera. And if I reformulate a little bit this, when I, I have the two over lambda is two P over H bar. So if I substitute, I have two over H bar the integral from X1 to X2 of basically P dx. And now this is useful because actually P, the momentum magnitude is related to uh, the energy uh, of the system. And think that this equation is related to stationary states. So what I'm gonna do is to obtain an approximate form of um, uh, for the energy levels based on this knowledge, which is approximate by WKB of the number of wavelengths. And so there's a name for that. But in any case, let me proceed. When I have an infinite square well, meaning that these walls would be infinite, um, I would not have the one egg length uh, wavelengths on each side. So basically there I would have I wouldn't have this factor of one half, and I would only have this. But still, I have the same formula, at least qualitatively on this side. And well, when only one wall is finite and the other is infinite, what you have is basically a factor of one fourth, accounting for the one eight uh, wavelength. And you have this. Now, perhaps you don't see yet the usefulness of this formula, but basically, this is what I want to show. Uh, you write the momentum magnitude. <clears throat> as a function of x via the known relation of the energy as basically um, kinetic plus potential. And that's why, or that's the way we define the momentum magnitude. So P is equal to this square root. And so this is nice because I will use this formula for P inside. And if I perform the integration and then later on do some algebra, think that this is quantized or this is quantized or this is quantized. So that's going to be giving me basically a quantized approximation of the energy eigenvalues. Uh, one thing to comment is that basically I will have a reindexing where m belongs to the naturals and I have m minus one half. But for example, for the harmonic oscillator, it might be useful to start from zero. So um, just giving a heads up. But in any case, uh, we have what is called the so-called, uh, sorry, WKB quantization condition, which is the result of this interval, right? Now I have two over h bar the integral over the domain uh, limited by the turning points of this integral representing the momentum. And we we'll notice that B is a function of x is constant, but I want to determine that constant actually in terms of the quantum numbers. And I have either m minus one half for potential will with final walls, and minus one fourth only when I have one infinite wall, or m when the potential level has two infinite walls, right? And m belongs to the nationals. So again, these are quantization conditions from the from which the energies can be approximated, the energy eigenvalues. And the approximation works better as n goes to infinity, basically in the semi-classical limit. But it is only exact for very few cases. I'm actually going to present two cases where the approximation gives me the exact values, but that is not common. Um, but OK, I'll present a couple simple examples. The first example is basically the infinite square well. So the potential looks like this. Have the barriers, the turning points for illustration just for this picture, not for the algebra. I'm a, I'm minus one and one. And the potential, as you know, is basically zero uh, inside uh, the region defined by the turning points minus AA. Now it's general and then infinity outside. So the pot uh, potential has its turning points uh, minus A and plus A and the wave function vanishes, right? And uh, the particle cannot escape this box uh, for 
because any positive energy is basically intersecting here and then it cannot go outside. Um, and uh, we will use the formula for the case where the potential walls are both infinite. So here I don't have uh, an additional term. And I have just that the quantum number M where M belongs to the Nashvalds is two over H bar the integral from minus A to A of PDX. Now, I'm gonna use my formula, right? That I have here. And B is equal to zero inside the uh, region, the classical region. So if I were to substitute, basically I have this integral inside the classical region, then B is zero, so I have this. This is constant, it goes outside. The integral of this is very simple. This is just 2A. And I mean, perhaps you see that we're getting closer. So I pass to the other side, H over two. I have M divided by 2A have this, what if I square? So I have, uh, basically I'm passing two M to the other side. I have E equal to one over two M, H over two times M uh, divided by two A where M is a quantum number. And I have the infinite square well, which is of length uh, basically two A. So I'm gonna define L as two A to formulate the energies obtained approximately. Now you see that I got energies or energy I can value is quantized by the WKB quantization conditions and this form. So I have a factor of eight, then I have H, M, L, and then I have this, and M is equal to this. So perhaps it's harder to recognize the energies because I'm using H and not H bar. Um, but if I compare this with the true values for the eigenvalues of the infinite square well potential, I will have this, look at this. This is the known formula, right? You actually uh, saw this on your midterm. So substituting h bar equal to h over two pi, there's gonna be some cancellation because this is a squared. So this uh, pi factor vanishes and I have two times four. So I'll have the eight, then I have the mass, blah, blah, blah. And then I have, yeah, m squared, h bar squared, eight and l squared, which is exactly what I got here. So with m belong to the Nashvalls. So actually we get the exact uh, balance of the true energies. So that's nice. Uh, so this is one of the few cases in which it works exactly. And the second case, more complicated, where it actually works exactly to the harmonic oscillator. So this is my harmonic potential. I have an energy. Of course, these are the turning points, which depend on the energy that I have. And uh, this is my potential, of course, harmonic. And both of the walls and the potential where are finite. So that's why I have the factor of one half over here for the summand. And M belongs to the natural. So, well, if I basically use this quantum number instead, the thing that is the harmonic oscillator, I basically shift. So I start with zero and I have N plus one half. So I am kind of know where I'm going to get. Um, and now we use P defined like this, uh, where I use the harmonic potential and I'm calling the mass uh, M naught. So just because. Um, and well, I also have to identify the turning points. So these are the intersections of the energy with the potential. And you would have uh, X equal to, or X squared equal to A squared. So this is the solution. It's actually gonna simplify. But in any case, let's perform the integral. So I have N plus one half equal to two over H bar integral over the classical region of my momentum with the energy minus potential like this. Then I'm gonna start to basically change variables to make things simpler. So I can factorize a factor of two M naught E uh, to have a one over here, then that will exit in a square root. Then I can basically also redefine a variable uh, so that it looks like something squared, which is what I'm doing exactly here. And that will also impact because I'm choosing an X variable. So I will have the Jacobian over this side. And then I multiply by one, so I need this other part. And uh, so this is simpler, but if I do this change of variables, I also need to change the limits of integration, meaning the turning points. Um, so, but this looks quite simple actually, because this is dz, the square root of one minus z squared integral. And this is very, this is basically the area under a circle and you will see exactly where. So if I compare with the formula for the turning points and then multiply by the Jacobian related to the change of variables, I have plus minus, turning points times the Jacobian, it simplifies to plus minus one, which actually makes a lot of sense. So what I have is, and by simplification, where I already uh, basically multiply all this, I have only M0 divided by itself, so this is one. So I have this factor, 
And then basically the integral from minus one to one of dc uh, square root of one minus c squared. So this is the area of a half circle of radius one clearly. So uh, I know that the result is gonna be pi over two, if I integrate from minus one to one. And so this is simple, some things uh, simplify. I have pi over two, then I have this two over h uh, times two e over omega. And some two simplify, then I have uh, two pi divided by h, which is the definition of one over h bar. So I have this, and so oh surprise. What I get when I pass the h bar omega to the other side is that the quantized energies are en equal to h bar omega n plus one half, where n starts from zero and goes to all the natural numbers. So actually, these are the two energies of the harmonic oscillator. So this is also one of the simple cases where you get the exact energies. And so uh, this is what we mean when we say that the WKD method works perfectly for the harmonic oscillator because we actually get the exact true analytical energies uh, for the harmonic oscillator via the WKB method. So I hope that this has illustrated the usefulness of WKB, both in their understanding of the wave function and second calculation of energies. Uh, these are some references that I had used and I will post the notes as well. And I hope this has been nice. I really think these calculations are cool. And next week we'll finish with scattering. So we're getting there. Best of luck. <laughs>